Welcome to this lesson on analysis of competing hypotheses, also known as ACH. Let's look at some simple hypothesis testing examples. You're at a grocery store examining an apple, trying to decide whether it's edible or not. It smells fresh, has a firm skin, and has no bruises or blemishes. We can represent this evidence of edibility in a matrix. Note that we don't have any evidence to suggest the apple is inedible. In our next example, a table lamp doesn't work. There are three possibilities. The bulb is blown, the circuit fuse is blown, or the switch is malfunctioning. The bulb is new. Other fixtures on the same circuit are also working. Note that in this example, we have some evidence that suggests two of the hypotheses aren't likely. Review the scenario on the slide. Then on a sheet of paper, construct a matrix and indicate in the cells whether for each item of evidence, the woman either stole the painting or did not. The matrix should look something like this. Now indicate in the cells whether for each item of evidence, the woman either stole the painting or did not. When we believe something to be true, how do we usually go about attempting to prove it? For example, a few presidential elections ago, there was a widespread belief, a hypothesis, that General Colin Powell would be a candidate. What are some of the things we have heard that fed the speculation? All of this was evidence that the general would run. Even on a day-to-day -day basis, our minds are constantly weighing evidence to support our beliefs. Is a product of the human mental trait I call focusing. Let's try this again using the example on the slide. Think about each hypothesis. You just had the front end realigned a few days earlier. It's possible it's gone out of alignment again, but unlikely. You check the air pressure in each tire when you got gas 15 minutes ago. It's possible that a tire is losing air, but unlikely in just 15 minutes. You also examined the tires at the gas station and found no bulges. That leaves a fourth hypothesis, a foreign object embedded in one of the tires. This problem-solving approach, commonly referred to as trial and error, illustrates the role that hypotheses routinely play when we analyze a problem. In this case, you have generated four hypotheses, four postulated causes for the vibration. Whereas, in the trial and error approach, we analyze each hypothesis in isolation, in the hypothesis testing technique, we examine them together, in fact, side by side. Let me show you how. First, we list the four hypotheses side by side, labeling them, not surprisingly, hypotheses. Then we list down the left side the evidence we have ascertained regarding each hypothesis. Now we construct a matrix connecting the four hypotheses and the three items of evidence. This is a hypothesis testing matrix. Instead of evaluating each item of evidence against only one single hypothesis, the matrix allows, no, compels us to systematically apply all of the evidence to all of the hypotheses, thus ensuring that our analysis is comprehensive and objective. The sole criterion in our evaluation is consistency. Consistent means in harmony with, in accord with, and compatible with. We want to try to determine or estimate the degree to which the evidence is consistent. C, inconsistent, I, or ambiguous, a question mark, with a particular hypothesis. Let's try it. One way to better understand what the word consistency means in this context is to ask, given this item of evidence, could this hypothesis be true? If the answer is yes, the hypothesis could be true, then the evidence is consistent with the hypothesis. If the answer is no, the hypothesis could not be true, the evidence is inconsistent with the hypothesis. 
Is front end aligned only a few days before consistent or inconsistent with the first hypothesis? It is inconsistent, so we enter an I in that cell. Please note that consistent or inconsistent aren't absolutes. I'm sure that you can come up with a scenario in which every piece of evidence is consistent with every hypothesis. That gets you nowhere. Use the reasonable man test or beyond a reasonable doubt test. At this point, our guess must be that a foreign object is causing the shuddering and vibration. Why? Because we've eliminated the first three hypotheses. We've disproved them. And that is precisely the aim of hypothesis testing. To disprove, not to prove a hypothesis. Of course, we haven't proven that a foreign object is, in fact, the cause. But at this point, it remains the most likely hypothesis. Here are some critical teaching points. What does the matrix show about the evidence that is consistent? That it isn't useful. It has no diagnostic value or purpose in determining which hypothesis is most likely. What evidence is useful in a value? That which is inconsistent. Why? Because it eliminates hypotheses or reduces their likelihood. So, to repeat, the purpose of hypothesis testing is not to prove a hypothesis, but to look for ways to disprove it. Hypothesis testing, or ACH, more than any other structuring technique, exposes our human tendency to seek and rely on supporting evidence, consistent evidence. Let's review the steps in hypothesis testing that are listed on the slide. First, we generate hypotheses. Second, we construct a matrix and list hypotheses at the top. Third, we list significant evidence down the left margin. We are seeking contradictory and absent evidence. Next, we'll test each piece of evidence for consistency with each hypothesis, working across the matrix. Use C for consistent, I for inconsistent, or a question mark for ambiguous. Fifth, we'll refine the matrix. Working across the matrix now, we'll delete any evidence that is consistent with all hypotheses. Reword or add hypotheses as needed. Six, working down the matrix, evaluate each hypothesis. Delete those for which there is significant, inconsistent evidence. Seventh, rank the hypotheses by strength of inconsistent evidence. The hypothesis with the weakest inconsistent evidence is most likely. And lastly, perform a sanity check. Let's practice hypothesis testing on yet another example. Using the hypothesis testing technique, determine which of the three women most likely was the visitor. What's the first step? Generate your hypotheses. So, what are the hypotheses? Jane, Mary, and Helen. What's the second step? Construct a matrix with the hypotheses. What's the third step? List significant evidence down the left side. To simplify the exercise, We'll defer for the moment seeking contradictory evidence. What's the fourth step? Test the evidence against each hypothesis for consistency. And the fifth step? Refine the matrix by deleting evidence consistent with all hypotheses. Why do we delete them? That's correct. We delete the evidence that is consistent with all hypotheses because it's not diagnostic. What's the sixth step? Evaluate each hypothesis and delete those for which there is significant and valid inconsistent evidence. In this case, Jane and Helen. What's the seventh step? Rank hypotheses by their likelihood based on the strength of inconsistent evidence. Obviously, Mary is the most likely visitor. Does this mean that Mary was conclusively the visitor? Absolutely not. She's just the most likely candidate at this point. Now is a good time to seek contradictory evidence. What evidence not included in the matrix would refute one or more hypotheses? Some ideas. The visitor's race, whether she was smoking, what language or accent she spoke with, and so on. And what's the final step, the eighth step? Perform a sanity check. Let's work the lost computer files problem. Take a minute to review the scenario listed on the slide. The scenario continues on the next slide. For the sake of simplicity, let's forego consideration of absent evidence in step three. You may pause the video to give yourself more time.
And the scenario continues on this slide. Now, we'll refer back to our earlier lesson on sorting timelines and chronologies, and we'll build a timeline to show who was in the office when, and X means they were present in the office during these times. Next, we'll determine which members knew how to operate the computer well enough to delete the files, and which members knew the password to the files stored in the backup system. Use the hypothesis testing technique to determine who deleted the files. Remember, step one, generate your hypotheses. There are five hypotheses, Edward, Sam, Gerald, Lisa, and Chuck. Step two, construct a matrix and list the hypotheses at the top. Step three, list significant evidence down the left margin and seek contradictory evidence. There are three items of evidence to be tested against the five suspects. The perpetrator was alone in the office. The perpetrator knew how to use a computer well enough to erase the records, not only in the main database, but in the backup system as well. And the perpetrator knew the password for access to the backup system. In step four, work horizontally across the matrix. Test the evidence for consistency with each hypothesis, one item of evidence at a time. Next, refine the matrix. The answers to the questions on the slide are both no. So let's move on to the next step. We'll evaluate each hypothesis. All three items of evidence are inconsistent with Sam, so we can eliminate him as a suspect. Both Edward and Lisa can be eliminated because neither was ever alone in the office or knew the backup system password. We are thus left with Gerald and Chuck. In step seven, we rank the hypotheses by strength of inconsistent evidence. And lastly, we'll perform a sanity check. I think our findings are reasonable. Now that we've worked several problems using the hypothesis testing technique, it's time for you to test your skills in solo. Use the Kosovo problem I introduced in a previous lecture to try your hand at hypothesis testing. You may download the Kosovo problem handout. It's included as a resource to this lecture. Once you have the handout and read the scenario, apply the eight steps of hypothesis testing. We'll compare your work with mine in the next slide. This is the matrix you should have constructed. I haven't showed you how I judge the evidence, but hang on to your problem because we'll come back to it in the final exam. Since evidence is so crucial to hypothesis testing, now is a good time to make a few points about evidence. A hypothesis is a declarative statement that has not been established as true. If we knew it to be true, then it wouldn't be a hypothesis. We assert the truth of a hypothesis by offering supporting evidence. But as the late philosopher Karl Popper established, we can never really prove a hypothesis true. We can and do, however, for countless reasons, accept hypotheses true until they are proven false. We disprove a hypothesis with evidence. Information becomes evidence only when we can connect it to a hypothesis. Thus, we scan information looking for evidence. When we find evidence, we should try to establish its validity by answering the four questions listed on the slide. To expand on the questions above, here are some other issues to consider with regards to a source's access. How did the source obtain the information? Was the method plausible? For example, if the source of the information claims he read the information in a certain document, is it reasonable that the source had access to the document? Additionally, in question three, we should ask, is the source reputable? Has other information from the source proven to be accurate? Finally, from question four, we ask, from the standpoint of everything we know about the problem and from just plain old common sense, does the information seem to make sense? Is such information common or rare? 
Because the weight of evidence is so important to hypothesis testing, some experts have refined their analysis and generated more accurate results by adding these two steps to the process. The newly added steps are, in step 6, assign a numerical weight from 1 to 10 to each finding of inconsistent. The greater the inconsistency, the greater the weight. A weight of 1 represents the minimum degree of inconsistency. A weight of 10, the max. Step 7. Add the numerical weights of the inconsistence in each hypothesis. Then, as before, the hypothesis with the smallest numerical weight is the most likely. I've applied these two steps to a number of experimental problems using hypothesis testing and found that they help significantly in identifying the most likely hypothesis. Experiment with the process on your own and determine which version of hypothesis testing works best for what type of problem. Congratulations again! This lesson on ACH completes all the lectures in this section on intelligence analysis.